Uh, I'm Marcella Bonvales, uh, President of Weinstein Imaging. Uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a uh, private practice specializing in women's imaging. I will be speaking on BIRADS for ultrasound today. Today I'm going to be talking about BIRADS for ultrasound. These are my disclosures. BIRADS Atlas 5th edition came out in January 2000. 14. Uh, the Atlas, uh, the chairman of the, uh, the of the committee was Dr. Dorsey, and it was the committee was divided into three subcommittees. One in mammography, which was the fifth edition. Uh, Dr. Sickle uh, led that committee, and then uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Morris led the MRI edition, second edition. The ultrasound second edition was. Uh, chaired by Dr. Ellen Mendelssohn. Uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, Dr. Berg, and I were the writing committee. BIRAT stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. It's a practice management system developed for imaging containing several important components. One, a lexicon, a lexicon of descriptors for feature analysis of breast lesions. Also, a reporting structure which includes final assessment categories and management recommendations. In addition, it's a framework for data collection and auditing. The BIRAT structure contains different uh, uh, chapters, one in anatomy, another image quality, tissue composition, feature analysis, the lexicon, which includes masses, calcifications, associated features, and special cases. It also includes a part in reporting systems, guidance, frequently asked questions, and there's an appendix. The additions and changes from the previous edition include the um, discussion on density limitations of mammography, the need of correlation with ultrasound depiction of tissue composition. There's an increase, uh, there's been an increase in the sec anatomy section. There's also now a new section about associated features, which includes the effect of lesions on surrounding tissue, architectural distortion, also includes vascularity and elasticity assessment of the lesion. There's a expanded, the, the importance of image quality and accurate interpretation has ex, been expanded. There's guidance and frequently asked questions. This section has also been expanded. Uh, expanded to include screening considerations and the need for audit. As we know, there's been a lot of talk recently about breast density. The radiologists need to discuss, the need for the radiologist to, to discuss the breast density and its, in, in its implication to increase risk of breast cancer. And here in a mammogram, we know very well that it, de breast density has been divided into um, fatty, B, sc uh, typical scattered breast density, heterogeneous would be C, and D, a very dense breast. Mammography is very limited in those patients with a very dense breast compared to those patients with a very fatty breast. Ultrasound can also determine the uh, tissue uh, composition of the breast. As in this case, you can see a medialidal like projection of a mammogram showing a very dense breast, correlating very well with this ultrasound, uh, adjacent ultrasound uh, perpendicular projections. You can see that the uh, skin layer is seen through echogenic lines uh, separated by a hypoechoic area. Beneath that is a subcutaneous fat, and then you see very echogenic tissue with tubular hypoechoic structures which represent ducts. This is typical, a typical case of a homogeneous fibroglandular tissue uh, breast. Also, the breast could be homogeneously fat, and this is a good example showing which is composed of uniformly of hypoechoic fat lobules and echogenic tissue arcs, which are the Cooper's ligaments. Or we could describe the tissue as heterogeneous, and that's either focally or diffusely variable in echo texture with many small areas, increase and decrease echogenicity. And here you on the mammogram medial light of like projections, you can see a heterogeneous uh, breast density in which there's areas of fibroglandular tissue and areas of fat 
corresponding very well with the adjacent ultrasound study uh, showing the subcutaneous fat and then an area of echogenic tissue within the echogenic tissue there's hypochoic areas which is fat within the fibroglanular tissue. We've increased the uh, section, we've uh, made it uh, much more um, descriptive, the, ar the area on anatomy. And uh, the breast uh, is described as a modified swept gland between two layers of superfic superficial pectoral fascia on the anterior thorax between the second and sixth ribs. The posterior fascia layer lies just anterior to the pectoral muscle, and the anterior fascia layer lies uh, just beneath the skin. The breast is made up of 15 to 20 segments of major ducts and branches. The lobules radiate from the nipple and subdivide into lob lobules. Subcutaneous kinetic tissue from septa, the cuprous ligament between the lobe lobes and lobules which go from the dermis to the superficial fascia can many times be identified well with ultrasound. Uh, the nipple areal complex can be difficult sometimes to see with ultrasound unless we do certain maneuvers. For example, this is a normal nipple areal complex it can be seen well because abundant gel was placed uh, about between the nipple and the um, transducer. Here we see nicely that the nipple uh, is seen as a hypoechoic, well uh, circumscribed mass. And the, the skin layers are well seen here, two echogenic layers uh, separated by a uh, hypoechoic uh, area. But important here is that we can see very well, by using this technique, we can use very well, you can see the area behind the nipple. Uh, when uh, you're not, when you don't use gel or you don't use an offset pad, many times the nipple can cause posterior acoustic shattering, obliterating visualization posterior to the nipple. The new automated breast ultrasound units also are very helpful in visualizing the areal, the nipple areal complex and the tissue posterior to it, as you can see here. Uh, this is the coronal view. You see nicely the skin and the nipple, and here are the uh, perpendicular projections uh, and the nipple can be well evaluated. Uh, in contrast to this patient, which a lot of gel was also used to be able to uh, visualize well the nipple, but in this case the patient had a very large nipple and this was mucinous carcinoma of the nipple, a very rare uh, uh, process. The ducts can be seen by ultrasound as anechoic bands up to eight millimeters wide near the nipple. They decrease in size distally to about a one millimeter, and you can see the arborization here in, in these two ultrasound images. We've added a new section, Associated fi Features, and it's the effect of the lesions to the surrounding tissue, it includes architectural distortion, um, skin thickening, uh, um, pulling of the nipple, and I'm going to show you a few cases of that. Also, the uh, effect of vascularity in the lesion and elasticity assessment. The associated features include no effect of the mass, no effect of uh, the surrounding tissue to the mass, or a, some sort of effect. Architectural distortion can be seen as disruption of anatomic planes, Cooper's ligament straightening or thickening, the duct changes in the caliber or arborization, skin thickening or retraction, or edema. In addition, vascularity, is it present or is it absent? Is it in the mass or is it outside of the mass? And the effect uh, in evaluation of elasticity. Here is a supine automated breast ultrasound unit uh, image showing um, very nicely the uh, a cancer architecture. You can see a hypochoric ill-defined mass pulling off the skin. There is a, a, a straightening of the Cooper's ligaments and the adjacent, uh, it's very well seen that there is associated uh, surrounding uh, effect uh, to the tissue. 
Uh, here on the lower left is a coronal view, uh, which is a lateral coronal view seen here on this diagram showing nice the speculations uh, uh, of the mass uh, the effect it has on the surrounding tissue. The crosshairs here all correspond to each other, and you can see well that on this diagram that this mass was uh, is, was uh, this image was obtained in the left lateral projection, and at the time it is two o'clock, and the distance it is from the skin, and the distance it is from the nipple. Another uh, patient you can see or on the coronal view the specular little hypochoic or actually expiculated mass on the coronal projection, when you put the crosshairs there, you see that the mass is an irregularly marginated mass with posterior acoustic shadowing, pulling of the Cooper's ligaments, uh, thickening of these ligaments and pulling. And, um, so there is a definitely uh, effect on the surrounding tissue. In addition, you can see that the mass is protruding into the ducts invading the adjacent ducts. Effect, uh, what effect the lesion has on vascularity? And here you have a very irregular mass, uh, edema surrounding the mass. Uh, this is a suspicious mass, it's an, some an enhancement, very suspicious. When we put flow, we see that there is increased blood flow not only to the mass, but in the surrounding edematous tissue. A different patient with only increased flow in the rim of the mass. The mass is well circumscribed, it's heterogeneous, and there's no flow within it. it the flow is in the surrounding tissue, and this is an abscess. Elasticity is tissue stiffness, and it's really become the 21st century population. The expectation is that malignancy is hard and be something benign will be soft. However, there is a superimposition of both. There's two types. There's the strain and the shear wave elastography. And we still need to develop descriptors for these two types of uh, elastography. Now, we can also quantify the uh, amount of tissue stiffness, which will help us in better determine if the lesion is hard or soft. And here in shear wave, you can see uh, an example of a s blue is soft, and that's supposed to be benign, and hard is red. As you can see in this little image, there's, there's lots of red and yellow surrounding this mass. And then there's a big range of cases that are inter indeterminate. And here are two different patients. Again, a, a ill on, the, on the B mode, you can see uh, ill-defined ma hypoechoic mass with sh shadowing, irregularly shaped, and this is, looks like a cancer. And when you put the elastography, you see that there is very stiff tissue surrounding the mass. In contrast to this on your right, a circumscribed oval mass parallel to the skin layers. Sonographically, it has all the characteristics of a benign lesion. When we did elastography, yeah, it corresponded well with it blue, it was soft, the mass was soft, the adjacent tissue was soft. This would correspond to a bite and give you confidence that th this does not need any further evaluation with a biopsy. Strain elastography, it's been described that trilaminar sign in patients which have debris containing cysts, and here's a, uh, a hypoechoic debris containing cysts with uh, enhancement posteriorly. And many times you can't tell in these cases if it's um, a debris containing cysts or actually a, a, a mass. Well, they've described the trilaminar sign in which the three colors are seen red yellow and blue, and this should help you differentiate debris containing cysts from um, a cancer. However, I want to show you this case I had uh, recently in which you see a irregularly marginated mass, hypoechoic mass. This looks, it is suspicious for malignancy. When we did the elastography, we got the trilaminar sign, which would lead us to believe that it was benign. However, because of the morphology of the mass, we biopsied it, and this was a mucinous carcinoma. So you need to be careful. Morphology is most important. 
We also have really expanded the section on the importance of image quality and accurate interpretation. We talk about the trans transducer frequency. Important to have a high-end transducer that's 12, between 12 and 18 megahertz with a 5 centimeter penetration. The importance of gain in focal zone to differentiate a cyst from a solid mass. We also talk about the importance of knowing when to use compound imaging and when to use harmonics. The field of view, the depth setting of the tissue that will display on the monitor should not include the pleura or the lung. For large lesions, consider using an extended field of view, panoramic or sometimes uh, uh, um, said to be called panoramic. panoramic. Or the trapezoid acquisition can be used in these uh, large lesions. Important the patient positioning. Also avoid compression when evaluating with color to, to, to avoid occluding the blood vessels. Here we have two different, uh, we have the same patient with using a 12 megahertz and a 17 megahertz transducer. On the top, the 12 megahertz transducer does identify the calcifications within the ducts. However, the 17, linear 17, better lin visualizes the uh, calcifications within the ducts. Here's two, pa two uh, images with the same uh, cyst, and you can see that the tissue posterior to the simple cyst it enhances brightly, it, but the refraction shattering at the lateral margins of the cyst obscures the adjacent tissue in this with a native mode. When you add the uh, spatial compounding, you can see much better the uh, margins of the cyst. Also, you can see the area posterior to the cyst, even though the enhancement is decreased with comp spatial compounding. So it's important for you to know that you should be able to go back and forth, use spatial compounding when you may evaluating a cyst, and sometimes you may need to go back and use a native mode. Wide field of view. It can be very uh, helpful in cases in which you have multiple cysts to try to, to see the uh, uh, relationship between one mass and the other mass. And this is the panoramic view that can be obtained with most uh, machines. And here is the automated breast ultrasound unit showing very nicely uh, a field of view that extends 14 centimeters. And so you can see multiple dilated ducts with hypochoic material with it it's also seen in the coronal projection here uh, in this patient who had multiple abscesses. A mass. A mass is defined as something that occupies space and should be seen in two projections. Masses can be distinguished from normal structures such as ribs or fat lobules using two or more projections and real-time scanning. It's Combine multiple features are the best predictors of a mass if it's benign or malignant. Multiple features should always be used, but the most important are shape, margins, and orientation for ultrasound. Don't just select one. Parallel or wider than taller is not always benign. Many cancers can also be parallel to the skin. So, the lexicon, feature analysis of the masses. The big three include shape, orientation, and margins. Shape includes oval, including macrolobulated, round, or irregular. Orientation is parallel to the skin or not parallel to the skin. And margins include circumscribed or not circumscribed. We are now including in this section the echogenic rim. Under non-circumscribed, it's indistinct, microlobulated, angular, and speculated. So masses can either be oval, round, or irregular. Or oval are when they're elliptical or egg-shaped. They may include two or three undulations, gently lobulated or macrolobulated. Round is when it's spherical, ball-shaped, circular, or globular.
Irregular is when it's neither round nor oval. Here's a good example of an oval mass. It's um, two projections. Here's different cases, three different cases of a round mass. In both projections, the masses are round. Now, in this case, it's a papilloma. Here is a clot within a cyst. And here is a new uh, metastatic lymphadenopathy. Irregular is when it's neither round or oval. And you can see here three different examples of irregular masses. Orientation. That's a property of masses unique to ultrasound. It's defined with a reference to the skin line. It's parallel, wider than taller. Orientation is a feature of some benign masses such as fibroadenomas, but can also be seen in carcinomas. Shape, orientation, and marginal character sh characteristics should always dictate the assessment category. Here is a diagram of the sh an oval shape in a mass that's oval but also oriented parallel to the skin. These are usually fibroadenoma cysts or sebaceous cysts, but they can also be seen in cancers. And here's an example of two ultrasound cases. Long axis of the lesions is aligned with the skin layer. It's horizontal or wider, uh, better, wider than uh, taller. However, on your left side, you see the circumcised mass, which is, has the characteristics of a benign fibroadenoma. On your right, also a mass that's parallel to the skin, and also you can see that this patient had implants. It's, the mass is just abutting the implant. But this mass is not, well, or it's not circumscribed, it's lobulated, it's irregular. And this was a cancer. Another irregular uh, mass, which was parallel to the skin layers in both projections, and this was a cancer. What about masses that are not parallel to the skin? The anterior, posterior, or vertical dimensions is greater than the transverse or, hor or horizontal dimension, sometimes called, referred to as vertical or taller than wider. Round masses are not parallel. Non-parallel masses can also be obliquely oriented. And here are two irregular masses which are not parallel to the skin layers. Uh, and these were two different types of infiltrate ductal carcinoma. And here is a diagram showing a round mass which is uh, not parallel to the skin. And these usually referred to as cancers, but can be seen in cysts and abscesses. Margins, circumscribe or not circumscribe. The margin is the edge or the border of the lesion. Circumscribed means well-defined, smooth, distinct rim. And here you see it in a cyst. Non-circumscribed include indistinct, can be either indistinct, angular, microlobulated, or spiculated. Angular is part of all margins have sharp corners or form acute angles as in this case. In the perpendicular projection, you can see that there's angulation of the margins. Indistinct are poorly defined, and you can see here this hypoechoic mass, which you can't really delineate well. And this was an infiltrate ductal carcinoma too. Microlobulated, when there's greater than three small, short, cir cir cycle indulations, as in this case. These are perpendicular projections of the same mass, which was also a cancer. Speculated. These are margins formed or characterized by sharp lines projecting in from the mass into the adjacent tissue. And this mass, you can see here, perpendicular projection was a malignancy. We have now moved the echogenic halo rim to, uh, to be part of the non-circumscribed margins. And the echogenic rim is not a sharp 
demarcation when there's not a sharp demarcation between the mass and surrounding tissue. This can be seen in cancers and also in abscesses. Echo pattern. Well, it can be either anechoic when there's no internal echoes, hyperechoic when it's defined, it's defined relative to the fat and equal to the fibroglanular tissue. Hypoechoic is defined also relative to the fat and it's low level echoes throughout. It's seen, uh, it can be seen in complicated cysts or fibroadenomas usually. Anechoic, here's an example of a mass with no internal echoes and this was a cyst. Hypoechoic, re relative to the fat, low level echoes throughout and similar to the adjacent um, or when compared, it's hypoechoic compared to the adjacent uh, fat lobules. Uh, this can be seen in uh, complicated cysts, seen in this case, or fibroadenomas. Hyperchoic is when it's homogeneously hyperchoic, defined relative to the fat. And here we see a hy hyperchoic mass relative to the fat. Um, now, when you correlate this with your, the mammogram, which a patient came in with a palpable mass, you can see that this, there was no solid mass here, but just a fat lobule. So this represented a lipoma in this patient who had a palpable mass, which was hyperechoic on ultrasound. And that no, on, ultra, on mammography, it showed that it was fat density. Another patient, which has a very fatty breast, when we did the ultrasound of the palpable abnormality, which there was an ill-defined density there, or ill-defined Ill mass, we saw that the mass was hyperechoic compared to the adjacent fat lobules. In this case, because of the borders of the mass and on both the mammogram and ultrasound, ultrasound guided core biopsy was done, and this was an infiltrate ductal carcinoma. Another patient, this was a hyperchoic mass. She presented with a palpable abnormality. And the hyperchoic mass was also very echogenic. Or hype, uh, the borders were not well defined with uh, some shadowing. And this was a uh, lymphoma. Echo pattern can also include isoechoic when it's the same echogenicity as fat or it can be a complex cystic and solid mass combined, as in this example where there is a cystic area and also an echogenic area. And here is an example which can be correlated well with a mammogram in a patient with fat necrosis. Mixed hyper and hypoechoic uh, echo pattern can be seen. That's when portions of the masses are hyperechoic to fat and portions are hypoechoic to the fat with no cystic component. What about posterior acoustic features? Well, there could be no posterior acoustic uh, change, or there can be enhancement, increased posterior echoes, shadowing, decrease uh, posterior echoes, extending, uh, including, excluding edge shadows, and this can be seen in 60% of the ca cancers. Or you could have combined pattern in which there is both shadowing and enhancement. Here are three different patients. Uh, on this one on your left, there is really no significant uh, posterior acoustic uh, features. On your right, you see that this mass that has a cystic and a solid component has uh, prominent posterior acoustic enhancement. Shadowing is seen in this patient with regular mass with hypoechoic and shadowing uh, posterior to it. And in this mass here, it seems like there may be both some posterior and some enhancement to it. Calcifications, important to identify if they are not seen or if they are present. If they are present, are they micro calcifications, larger than 0.5 millimeters, or are they micro calcifications, which are out of the mass, outside of the mass, or in the ducts or within a mass? Here is a, 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 an ultrasound showing little calcifications within echogenic tissue in a patient with uh, calcifications that were outside of a mass. 
And here you see nicely on the mammogram, magnified view shows a patient with ductal carcinoma in situ, and the calcifications were able to be identified with ultrasound. The importance of this is that if you can identify the calcifications on ultrasound, you can do the biopsy under ultrasound guidance, which is much easier, quicker for the patient than a stereotactic core biopsy. A different patient came in with a palpable mass, and here you see medial lateral black projection and craniocardial view uh, right in the area. There, is some cal there are some calcifications, and better seen here on ultrasound, you see the mass, and the, when the calcifications are within the mass, they're usually much easier to see. This is a mass that was had cystic and solid components, and the calcifications were seen. Another patient in which calcifications were seen on the mammogram, going back and looking under ultrasound to see that the calcif these calcifications were seen within this duct, is, as I said, you're not going to change your decision if you're going to biopsy this because of what you see on ultrasound. You're going to make your decision on the morphology on them on the mammogram. But by visualizing them on ultrasound, you can certainly do the biopsy uh, and um, sample them. We have a section on special cases. These include cysts, complicated cysts, clustered micro cysts, interductal mass, mass in or on the skin, foreign body, lymph node, uh, intramammary or axillary, male breast, post-breast conversation, fat necrosis, and including vascular abnormalities such as AV malformation, pseudoaneurysms, and Mondor's disease. And I'm going to show you ex a few examples of these. Here's a, an example, micro, uh, a clustered micro cyst. And these are perpendicular projections, and you can see this is a mass with multiple tiny little cysts. Septations are thin, there are no solid components. It's very important to evaluate these carefully, make sure there's not a solid component, because it's been shown that there, if you do see a solid component, you probably should biopsy these. If you do not see any solid component, there's septations things like these things, septations. These are benign and don't even need to be followed. Interductal masses. Here's a case that the uh, panoramic imaging, a wide field of view, helped to show the extent of this interductal mass, which was a papilloma. What are bat masses in the skin? Well, this is a magnified view, as you can see, of the two skin layers and the hypochoic. Uh, area between the two uh, skin layers. Um, you can see here within it there is a mass which is debris containing with a little peak. Very typical of a complicated sebaceous cyst. These sebaceous cysts usually nothing needs to be done unless the patient is symptomatic and sometimes you'll aspirate them for a relief of the pain. But another patient here also had a little mass adjacent to the skin, and we did a um, cone compression view, and we could see it was arising from the skin, and you can see on ultrasound that it's really between, it's seen between the two skin layers. However, this mass had a very irregular borders or margins, as you can see here, and because of that, it was cored, and this was an infiltrate ductal carcinoma. So make sure the margins are clear, are circumscribed. Also, this in this section, it's including foreign bodies, such as free silicone. Here you see echogenic material outside uh, the uh, implant. Or post-operative scar, in which can be uh, seen sometimes as a hypoechoic mass with shadowing and can simulate uh, a cancer. However, you see this mass goes right into the skin and there is disruption of the skin layer where the surgery was done. Lymph nodes. Uh, lymph nodes are in this section. Here is abnormal lymph nodes uh, in asymmetry, uh, this asymmetrical thickening of this cortex uh, is very uh, suspicious for metastatic uh, lymph node, uh, uh, metastatic cancer to the axillary lymph node. Lymph nodes can be very large. The size is not as important as the region uh, uh, of how much uh, the cortex is involved with uh, is hypoechoic. In this case, this is a large echogenic lymph node 
in the ax axilla and is completely normal. Adjacent to it, there was another one. And the reason is the uh, hilum is completely uh, filled with uh, fatty tissue. These are two other normal appearing, sonographic appearing lymph nodes in the uh, breast tissue. And these look like almost like kidneys. They have a hypoechoic cortex and an echogenic hilum and flow it can be seen going right into the hilum. In this section we've included the male breast and here is a patient with a patient uh, a male with a palpable left subareolar mass. You can see that there is an asymmetry between one side and the other side. We cone compress the view and Posterior to it, we did see some irregularity and increased flow in this patient who had a gynecomastia. In these cases, sometimes you're forced to biopsy them if you're not sure you can make the diagnosis with the ultrasound and mammogram. Another patient came in here with a palpable, a male with a palpable right subareolar mass. Now you can see on the mammogram, the mass has irregular borders. There is retraction of the nipple pulling by the mass. And on ultrasound, there was an irregular ma uh, mass, hypoechoic, and this was uh, uh, an infiltrate ductal carcinoma. In this section, we also included fat necrosis. And here you can see on ultrasound, the mass, if you did just an ultrasound on this patient who came in with a palpable abnormality, you would see an irregular, high, round, hypoechoic mass, which is suspicious. For cancer. However, when you correlate it with a mammogram, you see that this is the region of the fat uh, of the lumpectomy site, and she has uh, developed fat necrosis. Mondor's disease. This uh, is included in this section, in which you can see here uh, a vessel. The patient came in with a palpable abnormality, and this was partially uh, occluded this uh, vein. Uh, another patient. Also, a very dilated, uh, beaded-like appearance of a vein, which uh, did not have any flow and even did not compress. And this was a Mondo's disease in two different patients. So at the end, we need to also, after evaluating mass, we need to be able to assess it. Is it negative? And give it a BIRADS-1. Is it benign? Give it BIRADS-2, such as a cyst or a fibroadenoma. Is it is it a probable benign? In this case, you may include fibroadenomas and you want a short interval follow-up. These are usually lesions that you think have less than 2% likelihood of malignancy. Or is it suspicious for malignancy? Greater than We have divided now, uh, BIRADS-4 has been divided into BIRADS-4A, which is 2 to 4, uh, 2 to 10% uh, malignancy risk or 4B, 11 to 50% risk of malignancy or 4C, 51 to 95% uh, risk of malignancy. Or is it BIRADS-5 in which there's highly suspicious for malignancy, greater than 95% likelihood? Or is it a patient that had already a known carcinoma and now is here for evaluation of another lesion? So in summary, Check technical quality before attempting to interpret any imaging examination. Appreciate the importance of real-time observation. And in analyzing a lesion, use the feature analysis categories first that shape the margins in the orientation. Descriptors within each category should also be included. Integrate ultrasound with other modalities in clinical data. Reach a conclusion, final assessment with a recommendation. Thank you.